Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Today, we are going to observe a course of training which prepares men to take their place in the Army and on the field of battle. Not with guns, but with something else, with words and thoughts. We take you now to a school which trains these men, to a small island not far from New York City, David's Island and Fort Slocum. Stone, head, hut! Ready, Fine. Right, hey. These men are soldiers in a special sense. They are chaplains, soldiers of God. They are dedicated to a spiritual mission of answering to the religious and moral needs of men of the United States Army, wherever they are stationed, wherever they may be called. These new chaplains, clergymen of all faiths, have volunteered for military service. Their parish, those to whom they will give spiritual guidance, will consist of soldiers. Their ministry will require knowledge of military life, and so, before being assigned to a unit of troops, they come here, directly from civilian life, to the chaplain school to learn how the army functions and how they will function with it. At this, their first army address, they meet and as most soldiers do during the first days of military life, become acquainted. So you haven't had much experience? No, as a matter of fact, I haven't. I've just graduated from the seminary, and then after we get through the course here, I go out to Fort Bliss as the assistant post chaplain. How about yourself? Well, we Catholics have a ruling that a man must have three years' experience before joining the Army. I've been a pastor for the past three years at St. Cloud, Minnesota. Oh, is that so? I have a pastorate, a small one, back in Tyler, Texas. After I finish school here, I'll have my reserve commission, and I'll be attached to a reserve unit in Longview, Texas. Just where is Longview? Longview is in East Texas, about 20 miles from Tyler. A clergyman may be here because he is entering on a career as a chaplain in the regular Army or he may have joined a reserve unit in his town or city. In either case, he attends the chaplain school for his adjustment to military life. And so the military life begins, and the army way becomes a clergyman's way. The adjustment is not a difficult one. Cleanliness is next to godliness, and he readily accepts what is in essential harmony with his religious creed. To be a source of spiritual strength to others, his own devotional life must not be neglected. At the chaplain center, he attends morning devotions. Services are conducted in the memorial chapel by Protestant students. Catholic chaplains celebrate their daily masses. Jewish services are held at the Chapel of the Eternal Light.
The Chapel of the Centurion is available for use by other denominational groups, including Episcopalian and Lutheran. Approximately 73 different denominations are represented in the chaplaincy, and provision is made for each chaplain to worship within the framework of church practice that is familiar to him. As class begins, the American principle of freedom of religion is truly borne out in practice here at the school where clergymen of all faiths meet. Side by side in a common belief in their country, they come to see more clearly than before the true meaning of American religious freedom. Although they believe differently, they work together in harmony without compromising their religious principles. At the chaplain school, it is assumed that the student is fully prepared by his church for his religious duties. Here, the effort is concentrated on helping him to supplement his religious training with a knowledge and understanding of his future military pastorate. He learns how a military headquarters operates and what his relationship is to that headquarters and other staff officers in it. He becomes better acquainted with the numerous ways he can offer assistance to the soldier who comes to him when in difficulty. He learns how he may help in the character guidance program. He begins to think more precisely about the actualities of aiding and guiding the individual soldier. There are many practical matters. How to keep a council book the official record of the expenditures of his religious fund, and many other details of the chapel and its supervision. Classes follow one upon another for the incoming chaplain, providing him with all kinds of necessary and helpful information. For those chaplains who have been in the field, the school provides an advanced curriculum. These are older men, experienced in the problems of the chaplaincy, yet eager to extend their knowledge. They find in this return to the classroom a rare opportunity to deepen the quality and feeling of their role as spiritual counselor. Although many of these men have been in the thick of combat, they have not forgotten to look lightly upon many matters that come into their province. Instruction on this pleasant island is sometimes conducted out of doors. The basic student is familiarized with the unique conditions under which he may have to perform his service. Frequently, a place of worship will have to be improvised with a few essentials. This portable altar equipment is supplied by the army while some chaplains are supplied with needed items of equipment by their own church. The chaplain's altar is often the hood of a jeep, the tailgate of a truck, or in an open field, wherever conditions permit, and sometimes where they do not, where danger is close by. It is during periods of extreme tension that the chaplain must be prepared to make great sacrifices, to perform long, arduous, and sometimes painful duties. Many chaplains have proven how deeply prepared they were, spiritually, also physically, for the ordeals of battle. Religious and military subjects alternate throughout the curriculum. A course in map reading, knowing where his men are, knowing where the enemy may be, this is just as important for the chaplain as it is for the infantryman. Proficiency in reading the compass is eagerly sought for, and some of the chaplains attain a skill in leading their men over other than spiritual fields. Audio-visual materials are widely used, 
not only to aid in instruction in the courses of the school, but to acquaint students with these devices for their future use in the many situations where they will be performing duties as teachers. Some equipment helps the chaplain to practice what to preach. In order to know what either is. However, in the final control of our lives, we must let faith control knowledge. Do not supplement faith with knowledge. Do not ever get beyond the simplicity and faithful living as everyone has opportunity to enjoy. Students may work with a tape recorder to listen to just how they sound to others. And they may try various types of speeches, which they may soon be delivering to troop units. In our hearts, we must mingle faith and true knowledge in order to know what either is. However, in the final control of our lives, we must let faith control knowledge. Do not supplement faith. But the machine is merely a tool. Nothing takes the place of the relationship of teacher and student. Chaplain Sullivan, when we speak of the spiritual roots of the American way of life, do we mean that man is primarily a spiritual being? Yes, Chaplain Anderson, when we say that the American way of life is rooted in the spirit, we mean that the idea of man implied is that he is, first of all, created in the image of God as a spirit. Yes, Chaplain Brown. Chaplain Sullivan, just what do we mean when we say that religion is at the basis of American life? When we say that religion is at the basis of American life, Chaplain Brown, we mean that in the thinking of our forefathers, especially the founding fathers, that our Judeo-Christian religious tradition was foremost. So to go on, gentlemen, with our study of the meaning of democracy as we have it in America, let us remember. The student's intellectual life has a place to grow here in the library which is an important focus of student activity at the Chaplin School for research as well as leisure reading. And some groups meet here, committees investigating some phase of work, discussing it thoroughly, and coming up with a report for presentation in class. The hours of study are long, the material for study is truly endless, and like all students, the chaplains are motivated, at least partly, by a desire to get the exams, like Satan, behind them. Working away at a desk is all very well, but a chaplain's work is with human beings, and so he looks forward to the opportunities of being with others. He enjoys active games, especially those like volleyball, which require cooperation and teamwork. Soon the chaplain will leave the school to join his unit. He will then become part of a great body of alumni scattered throughout the world, men who have chosen to give their lives in the service of God and country. Each man is imbued with a desire to meet the challenge, to bring God to men and men to God. Here in the Chaplain's Center is the Gallery of Remembrance, a room dedicated to those chaplains who lost their lives in the service of their country. The men whose pictures line the walls have brought honor to the Chaplain Corps, to the Army, and to themselves and their beliefs. Perhaps one painting here expresses the sacrifice that each has made. How do you do, Chaplain? How do you do, sir? I see you're looking at our Hall of Remembrance. Yes, sir. Sir, what is the significance of this painting? Well, this 
painting is a copy of the painting commemorating the sinking of the Dorchester in the North Atlantic in World War II, when four of our chaplains, one Catholic priest, two Protestant chaplains, and one Jewish chaplain, gave their life belt to enlisted men on board the ship. And of course, they went down with the ship. It also is a copy of the picture that was used in the making of a commemorative postage stamp honoring the chaplaincy in the armed forces. And who are the men in this book, sir? This book is, carries, has in it the picture of every chaplain since World War I and World War II and Korea who have either been killed in action or have uh, died as a result of the wounds of the enemy. These are the men and their pictures also on the wall who have paid the supreme sacrifice for our country as chaplains serving in the ministry to men in the armed forces. Varied as their beliefs may be, these men, chaplains in the United States Army, are joined together in their complete devotion to God and country. In another part of the world, over 6,000 miles away, on a small rocky island, is another kind of a story. Here, men are already in combat. Men fighting an invisible enemy, disease. This is the island of Okinawa, 12 miles wide, 18 miles long. While it isn't very big, its strategic location, only 400 miles from the mainland of communist China, has made it one of America's most vital military bases and earned it the nickname Keystone of the Pacific. Thousands of soldiers are stationed on Okinawa, ready to defend this island link in America's outlying perimeter defenses. When the Army first took over Okinawa in 1945, it found a war-shattered, disease-ridden island. Thousands of soldiers fell ill to malaria, typhoid, or cholera, or one of a host of other tropical diseases. It took a long, intensive campaign to clean up the island. Today, the combined medical staffs of the Army, Navy, and Air Force are working together to keep American troops here fit and healthy. This is the Okinawa Joint Committee on Preventive Medicine, a policy-making group. Its job is to plan the necessary steps to stop disease before it starts. Using modern scientific methods, they are operating a full-scale preventive medicine program. These men know that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Preventing sickness takes a lot of planning. Military facilities on Okinawa are first-rate. The men eat in cheerful family-style mess halls. One of the main jobs of the United States Army preventive medicine teams is to make sure that all food is free of harmful bacteria. To do this, inspections must be made regularly of Army kitchens. Daily visits by a preventive medicine officer helps keep kitchen personnel on their toes. These inspectors know every step of mess hall operations, where a hasty KP may grow careless, where hidden food particles may be caught unnoticed, and how to correct such oversights. A single contaminated tray could give food poisoning to many soldiers. All food is carefully examined before it is prepared for serving, for in this tropical climate, vegetables spoil quickly. Inspectors must be alert for tiny parasitical worms, which are so common in this part of the Pacific. Even the eggs are candled to ensure against blood clots or staleness. The preventive medicine program, of course, includes much more than army mess halls. Every food handling facility is inspected regularly by Army preventive medicine teams. 
at local markets and the slaughterhouses. Wherever food is handled, medical officers make their rounds. The system is check and double check. No germs will leave the slaughterhouse in this chopped meat. Every side of meat must pass U.S. government specifications and have a stamp of approval. Because vegetables pick up bacteria from the soil in which they are grown, soil samples are taken for laboratory analysis. In addition, once the vegetables have been picked, they undergo a further series of tests. Each new crop of produce is carefully studied. They must be clean and free from chlorine wash insecticides. Every step of the way from here to the soldier's mess tray is carefully regulated. Two crops a year are harvested from the army regulated farms, providing an abundant supply of fresh fruit and vegetables. Making sure that these foods are clean and safe is a must. A different aspect of the preventive medicine program is the medical assistance given to Okinawan natives by Uncle Sam. There will be no typhoid Marys here. Today, the Okinawans enjoy health standards higher than any they have ever known before. a small part of America's civil assistance program on Okinawa. Even the island's domestic animals must comply with preventive medicine regulations. If proper precautions are not taken, a sick dog today may spread disease tomorrow. Keeping the island's pets in good shape helps protect all of the human population. Quarantine prevents newly arrived animals from bringing in disease. Any suspected pet must spend his first few days in here. But the greatest single medical problem on Okinawa is the mosquito. The island abounds in ideal breeding places for mosquitoes known to carry malaria and yellow fever. It requires a constant program of scientific warfare to keep the mosquito problem under control. At regularly specified intervals, preventive medicine teams are sent out to scour the entire island, looking for breeding areas, collecting water samples, and studying the habits of the particular family of mosquitoes native to Okinawa. Although these teams have been fighting this problem for many years, they have never been able to eliminate mosquitoes entirely, but they have learned how to control them. Samples taken from suspected areas must be carefully isolated for future study. Some breeding spots can be detected with the naked eye, but as a rule, military scientists prefer to put water samples under microscopic examination. Laboratory facilities are not large, but they contain all the necessary equipment to do their job. When American forces first landed on Okinawa, there was not a single unpolluted water supply on the island. Today, men like these have succeeded in decontaminating almost every such source of disease. Scientific analysis reveals the exact content of every sample. Preventive medicine specialists then chart where remedial action is needed. In their headquarters, the Army scientists are able to plot out the exact location of every infected area and then plan their attack. Spraying by air using heavily concentrated liquid insecticides is one method. In this way, large areas may be decontaminated quickly and efficiently. Where breeding is concentrated, small teams using hand sprayers are usually called into action. Yes, these soldiers can relax and eat in comfort. They have no worries about their health. 
keeping food supplies free from disease, the natives happy and healthy, and even the dogs looked after, is part of this scientific war against disease operated under the supervision of the Joint Committee of Preventive Medicine. Even on Okinawa, the American soldier remains the best cared for fighting man in the world. At play, or on duty, these men are kept physically fit. Here on Okinawa, keystone of the Pacific, American soldiers protect American liberties. Proud, healthy fighting men, part of the greatest military team in history, the United States Army. Yes, preventive medicine teams like the one you have just seen are teamed with the other medical facilities provided by the Army to make the American fighting man the best cared for soldier in military history. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your Army in action on the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.